will now begin the International Conference on Advancing Security and Sustainability at the G7 Hiroshima Summit. This conference is organized by Soka University in collaboration with the G7 Research Group established by Professor John Curtin and of the University of Toronto. With the cooperation of our co-sponsors, the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation and International NGO and Soka Dakka International. Since its founding in 1971, Soga University has been committed to fostering capable individuals who will contribute to the peace of humankind. This is based on the university's founding principles set by the founder, Mr. Daisaku Ikeda, that is, be the highest seat of learning for humanistic education, be the cradle of a new culture, and fortress for the peace of humankind. Moreover, in 2014, our university was selected for the top global university project promoted by MEXT, the Japanese Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology. And we have been promoting individuals to foster capable individuals who can take action on the global stage. Based on these founding principles, our university is continuously working to create a global core in the field of peace research and education, I believe that today's meeting is one of the achievements of these efforts. This year, for the first time, we are focusing sharply on two critical, indeed existential, subjects that deserve center stage. The first is nuclear proliferation and disarmament. The second, climate change and its companions of clean energy and human health. We're also focusing very sharply on producing timely, well-tailored, actionable recommendations for G7 leaders at Hiroshima to adopt and act upon. It is significant that the G7 summit will be held this year in Hiroshima at a time of growing concern over the threat of the deployment of nuclear weapons due to the aggressive rhetoric and actions of Russia in waging its war in Ukraine, the deployment of missiles by North Korea, and the growing provocations that we witness in our local and global communities. As Prime Minister Kishida said, the choice of Hiroshima as a site of the summit is important to convey the reality of the atomic bombings to the world, including the G7 leaders, as a starting point for all efforts towards nuclear disarmament. We can all agree that no nation should seek to construct its well-being and prosperity at the expense of other nations. To this end, the first step is for us as individuals to live with the awareness that we cannot construct our own happiness on the unhappiness and misfortune of others. This sense of individual responsibility becomes a foundation for a more just global order. As an organization headquartered in the host country of Japan, we sincerely hope the readers of participating countries will engage in committed and irresponsible discussion on how to address and break through the challenges we face. The G7 was formed in response to several shocks in the early 1970s that sent the democratic world into severe decline. In response, at the end of its first summit, with Japan present outside Paris in November 1975, its leaders communicated to find the group's distinctive mission to protect within their own countries and to promote globally the values of open democracy, human rights, and social advance. Civil society engagement groups uh, then arose for business, labor, citizens, youth, women, think tanks, and for universities in the informal U7 Plus Alliance.
This proliferating institutional edifice fostered a growing policy performance. It strengthened even after the 2008 arrival of the bigger, broader, more diversely composed summits of the group of 20 systemically significant states. Then we look for publicly available evidence of actions taken to fulfill those commitments, such as budgetary allocations, legislation, announcements, and addresses such as the Prime Minister's address to the Diet. So based on our database of 674 assessments of the key commitments made since the first summit in 1975 until the 2021 summit, by the time the leaders met last June, compliance averaged 76%. It to 69% for Japan's 2016 summit in Isishima, and the average for that phase was still higher, 78%. Today, he is talking about G7, G20, and UN, UN United Nations synergies. Okay. Uh, some of the storm clouds beginning to gather back in 2008 with the global financial crisis, um, and that brought some significant changes in international relations, and I think in many ways kind of overshadowed uh, the, the, the world in many ways over the past decade, economically, uh, it suppressed growth, it brought, brought political changes, some of them uh, quite problematical. Uh, so I, I think perhaps some of the antecedents of the difficulties we are having today in international relations uh, go back to the 2008 global financial crisis. Uh, G7 diplomatic gains uh, could be made by engaging on various aspects of the UN and G20 agenda. Um, not just focusing on Ukraine, because in the Global South uh, there are uh, other important concerns that the G7 needs to try and have a positive relationship with those countries. Uh, potential to increase uh, engagement with global governance networks, as I mentioned, across a variety of policy areas, that's another way to reach out uh, by the G7. Uh, so despite challenges then, G7, G20, UN uh, agenda issues do uh, include some synergies between all of those countries. So hopefully that can help cement their relationships and sustain their relationships, despite uh, the strategic tensions that we have. So let me have a question from the younger student generation. Uh, sometimes head of like state turns, take turns unexpectedly and quickly dramatically. And however, G7, has to welcome those different varieties of leaders. But how does G7 manage to sustain their unity or their continuity despite of these kind of hectic replacement of leaders? Seen during the Trump presidency, and, and I basically made the point that it was kind of interesting. I think it was in, in France during the French presidency of the G7 that they, they didn't reach, a, they, they didn't have a leader's uh, declaration at the end of the summit. But by contrast, the G20 did have a leader's declaration. So it was kind of an interest. The perception is that somehow the G7 is this normative club with kind of shared beliefs, values, etc. But it, it didn't seem to be obvious that that was true for a few years. All of these so-called clubs have tensions at times uh, based on uh, political changes. But um, perhaps sometimes it serves the government's interest, even if they have disagreements, to, to maintain their membership. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess that's why it keeps going. But, but you shouldn't see the G7 as a, as a perfect club. At the moment, I think the, G, the, the conflict in Ukraine has really pushed them together as a group. Uh, so, so we are seeing more unity at the moment. So in the previous session, we heard about G7 contributions to global governance as a whole. Um, and in this session, we are going to focus on Japan's role in G7 governance. Uh, first of all, how Japan matches to the G7, and then I'm going to flip the question around and talk a little bit about how G the G7 matters to Japan in a variety of ways. And I'm going to take a historical perspective here. I'm going to look back across 48 summits between 1975 and 2022 uh, to sort of tease out some of those aspects that answer those questions. 
uh, and suggests what we might expect in the 49th Summit in Hiroshima. Uh, and inevitably the attention was focused on Trump and was focused on Merkel in that sort of confrontation across the table. But I think what got lost in the interpretation of reactions to that image was the position of late Prime Minister Abe uh, and his role as a, a sort of intermediary between the two. And that's certainly a theme I'll return to later on. But Japan has ensured that Asia has a voice within the G7. At the same time, Japan has made an intellectual contribution to the uh, G7's evolving agenda. The main slides of Prime Minister Takeshita uh, visiting the summit, uh, but announcing a five-year plan to double Japan's ODA contributions to over six trillion yen, um, making Japan in the process the second largest ODA contributor to the world. Japan, well, the G7 has mattered to Japan in helping it reinforce its status as um, a contemporary great power. By inviting Japan, by inviting Prime Minister Miki to the very first summits in Rambouille in November 1975, Japan was recognized as a great power of the day. I think another important aspect for Japan is managing the USA. Uh, Japan has gone out of its way to try and use the summit in order to manage the most important bilateral relationship in the world bar not as we used to refer to the Japan-US alliance. Discussions in South Korea are, are also moving towards the acquisition of a uh, nuclear deterrent against North Korea. These have serious repercussions for how Japan is thinking about security and this is why I think uh, denuclearization uh, and weapons of mass destruction are really uh, a centerpiece of the agenda of this year's um, G7. We saw Japan play a special role um, during the Trump administration in trying to push back against some of the um, less, uh, less orthodox approaches by the United States to manage challenges. But I think that we need to be very conscious that Japan needs to work with the other G7 members, again, to ensure that the G7 functions in areas uh, and ways that uh, benefit its members benefit the global community, not just by influencing the United States, but by bringing in other stakeholders such as South Korea, India, Australia, and Pacific Islanders. Your question, how does China's influence, how does China influence Japan's role in the G7 in Asia? Um, its, its behavior is influencing it in a way that boosts Japan's reputation, gives it more legitimacy. I want to link this to this view about leadership. And I mentioned leadership and agenda setting in my initial comments about the G7. Um, whether you like Mr. Abe or not, his leadership was really welcomed in much of the world, in the G7, in ASEAN, in South, Asia, South Asia. And uh, his leadership, again, resulted in trade agreements, resulted in economic partnerships, resulted in many positive initiatives that were welcomed in this region. I uh, came, to, came here to actually learn from you uh, because you, uh, you have been studying this issue for such a long time, so uh, uh, it's a great opportunity to me. Uh, I have two hats. One is uh, secretariat. It, it, what I do is uh, just prepare as a host, uh, prepare hotels, you know, every setting is done in a nice manner. Uh, director for Economic Bureau, I do the substance. Uh, I, my division is responsible for a Japanese delegation attending the G7 and the G20. Uh, the summit will take place from uh, 19 to 21st of May. And uh, actually this is one day longer than Isishima Summit. We will spend three days because uh, having a full discussion and also with partners are uh, you know, very important to us. Uh, there are two paragraphs regarding significance of the G7. Uh, one is the importance of the rule of law and uh, uh, not changing you know, status quo or by uh, use of force. Because uh, in domestic politics, rule of law is fairly easy because individuals are treated equally and rule of law is established in constitution. But in international community, is rule of law is you know established or is it a natural law? Of course, it is written even a charter, but uh, it's not so obvious. Uh, recently, we had uh, I mean like regarding uh, the Ukraine aggression, there was a United Nations General Assembly vote, March in 2022. You know, 141 countries in favor. 
the five against and 35 abstention, even in the face of you know aggression by Russia. So why you know 35 countries abstaining? So now uh, the fundamental principle of this international order is questioned. So we really want to highlight, you know, this is a fundamental principle, and we will strongly hold it. And the number two, uh, there are some description of many agenda. This basically is the importance of what is called uh, global south. So uh, those countries, uh, we invite you know, India, Brazil, and. Uh, uh, some uh, representatives from international organization like uh, uh, you know Comoro is a small country but uh, we really value the importance of AU uh, so even Cook Island is invited because we value Pacific Islands and you know and these uh, the regions so uh, this is how uh, uh, outreach program will be configured in the G7 summit next I want to uh, talk about uh, some priorities of the uh, Japanese presidency. First of all, regional issues really important, and Ukraine will continue to be the highest priority agenda. The another issue is uh, regarding Indo-Pacific region. European countries are, frankly speaking, now very busy with Ukraine. But uh, if you look at the relation with China and uh, Russia, uh, they uh, gradually understand. Uh, how we uh, this in, uh, importance of this region as well as how to deal with China uh, is uh, will become a very important issue. So uh, the Hiroshima summit will be an opportunity to affirm and strengthen the G7 uh, collaboration on uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. And uh, the second is a nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. The G7 will deepen uh, discussions to send a strong message that will advance realistic and pra practical efforts to link the ideal of a world without nuclear weapons with the reality we face in the harsh security environment. Uh, the third one is economic security. Uh, Hiroshima Summit, we would like to work on several issues in, uh, regarding economic security. Uh, one is resilient supply chain, and two, economic coercion. Three, non-market policy and practices. And the four, uh, malicious practices in the digital space. Five, uh, resilient uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, six, uh, critical emerging uh, technology is also important. G7 would like to show its strong will to work together on these agendas. Climate change. Uh, this is a really important issue. Although uh, importance for ensuring energy security is reaffirmed uh, in the face of Russia's aggression, uh, our goal to achieve net zero by 2050 based on the Paris Agreement remains unchanged and firm. Uh, food security, uh, when it comes to food, uh, given the current food crisis, it is urgently needed to ensure uh, access to affordable, safe, and nutritious food for all and to develop resilient food security. Uh, G7 will identify uh, structural vulnerabilities in the global food system and set pathways to overcome them. On health, uh, based on the lessons learned from the COVID-19, the G7 will show its determination to develop uh, and strengthen better global health architecture. Uh, in addition, uh, universal health coverage, USC, is an important agenda. G7 aims to contribute to achieving more resilient, equitable, and sustainable universal health uh, coverage. Most, one of the most important perspectives uh, we have is uh, the notion of human security. Because when we discuss about pandemics or you know health coverage or you know, in the end we uh, we need a concerted approach uh, to help uh, people on an individual basis. Uh, in, in the end, each individuals in developed countries as well as you know developing countries need to be the uh, saved. So this is a, a, a theme that we will promote throughout uh, various agendas. Development is also an area where we do this human-centered approach. 
for uh, support the vulnerable people or left behind. Another uh, importance is a development finance. Uh, because uh, some of the countries in the past have uh, received a very opaque uh, aid from uh, certain countries. And this aid resulted in non-sustainable uh, debt uh, crisis. In, uh, I, I was a director for Sri Lanka a few years ago, and Sri Lanka is really suffering from the heavy debt. And so uh, we really need to establish a kind of uh, you know, international norm to make the uh, development aid sustainable. And gender, so we would like to pursue this uh, synergization of uh, uh, efforts uh, so that uh, the gender problems in conflict area as well as the countries are settled among the G7. In digitalization, there are uh, lots of things and uh, technical advancement is happening over the world. But we really need to have a uh, norm standardization or uh, addressing uh, this digital question in a proper way. Uh, we need to address new issues, uh, address the vacuum of governance, such as the area of uh, metaverse and uh, new area of digital economy. So I expect that G7 will launch an institutional uh, arrangement for partnerships to increase transparency and, and uh, ability of uh, regulations. What? You know, if you're looking at what happened after the Ukraine invasion, there are some differences or uh, changes in international governance. If you look at G7 and G20, uh, before the Ukraine crisis, everybody was saying, you know, G7's era is over. You know, G20 is becoming more traction. But it's just so. Once this Ukraine uh, crisis happened, G7 showed a very strong unity, upholding fundamental values, implementing strong sanctions, and uh, this result in the today now. So the role of G7 is becoming more and more important. And also, uh, at the same time, the role of G20 is over, because Russia and China are behaving that way. I don't believe so. Uh, there are lots of issues that have to be settled through G20, such as health issue, climate change cannot be settled without participation of G20. So Japan would like to continue the work of the G7 as well as G20. The expertise and it will be different uh, depending on what uh, uh, international organizations or groups you are talking about. Ariosa-san, thank you very much for a really interesting lecture. Um, I'm wondering if you could share your views of how um, Japan as the host for the G7 this year understands the role of South Korea, India, Cameroon. What is the role of, of bringing them to the summit? How do you see translating their presence into practical policy? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, India is obviously G20 presidency, uh, we, and uh, so uh, we like to uh, keep a very close coordination with G7 and G20. G20 summit uh, in Delhi could uh, build on the efforts of the G7. Korea has recently shown that it had to play a, a role in uh, advancing free and open Indo-Pacific. And uh, it has a will and the responsibility to play uphold international order. So uh, that is uh, one of the reasons uh, we decided to invite Korea. So since the uh, uh, Indo free and open Indo Pacific is one of the important agenda uh, of the G7, having uh, Korea uh, in it, it is uh, really uh, we can expect uh, uh, synergy and also. Uh, we can uh, have a uh, Korean involvement in future efforts uh, to achieve uh, you know, peace and stability in this region. And it would not be the uh, only solution, but I wonder if how G7 summit will uh, address the issue of climate. Uh, there is health issue, 
you know, climate change issue, and each issue is dealt in a different way. But to deal with all of the issue, we not only mobilize our own resources, but also asking our other partners, like uh, some of the emerging countries will be able to also play their roles. So, uh, of course, G7 will show what we can first, but uh, I, I we think uh, mobilizing other uh, resources are also important. So we will do these kind of efforts in each of the area. Uh, so that is the way uh, we are thinking about, you know, uh, ensuring the uh, financing. So please do understand, summit is important because it will spark discussion among the ministries. If there is a summit, health ministers will meet. When health ministers will meet, all these, you know, uh, specialists dealing on specific issues will join their wisdom and uh, uh, need for action together. And then it will become health ministries communicate, I hope. And then the difficult part will brought to the summit. So, and the summit the leaders will discuss the most important issues, you know, the most difficult ones. So, uh, that's how uh, the way uh, G7 works. And, and that's why it is important. It's like, uh, you know, uh, having PhD without dissertation is nothing, right? You need to have a di dissertation. But through this, through, by, through the process, you learn many things, you research many things, and then you discuss, you discuss with professors, you do, and that's important. So this is why communicate is important. Uh, gender will be discussed through the synergization of efforts. I wonder how it will be prioritized in this summit and what are some of the discussions we could look forward to and possibly policies that will come out of this summit. Yes, uh, like uh, as I introduced, uh, the primary uh, concerns of gender issue, uh, uh, what we are uh, uh, doing through G7 is we really see the problem of you know a gender issue or women suffering from in conflict areas and so forth. Uh, we are advancing efforts called a nexus, uh, meaning uh, it will connect uh, this peace efforts and economic efforts and social efforts and so forth. Uh, but also uh, we are having a gender ministers meeting in Nikko. Uh, so. Uh, we uh, at that ministerial, uh, lots of discussion will be uh, done regarding gender issues, and then it will go to the summit as well. Uh, I am wondering if you could expand a little on uh, your plans on climate change, in particular with relation to ending fossil fuel subsidies. Uh. So your question is okay. I understand what you say. So what's new? So I think that's your question, right? And uh, I, I, my, I have to tell that uh, this uh, process is still ongoing, so I cannot say this is the answer now. Uh, but uh, I, uh, today, for today, I really want you to understand uh, Japan and G7, all of the members are really serious that uh, this Ukraine crisis will not slow our, our climate goals and commitments. So, and. Uh, we do this not only with G7 uh, uh, fora, but also uh, we do with G20 partners. Uh, India is very important in this issue, so uh, let's see. We know that you are already incorporating some developing countries and many other, I guess, any other specific things that really can show that balancing role of Japan, because it's a matter of the trust. You know, frankly, like when I went to the G20 India, you know, Russia, Europeans, and start fighting. Of course, you know, you cannot admit Russia's aggression. Like in case of Ukraine, we had a G20 foreign minister meeting in March. There was no joint communique because of the Ukraine issues. But the Indian presidency really did a good job. You know, they really wanted this outcome. So, okay, if Russia, China couldn't agree to paragraph 3 and paragraph 4, uh, be it. But uh, India pushes really hard that, you know, agree to all other paragraphs so that G20 can still cooperate on economic issues. On paragraph 3, paragraph 4, it leads to uh, very, very to Ukraine. 
uh, China and Russia didn't subscribe, to, but all others subscribed to the Bali language which we adopted. Uh, so in the process, Japan as G7 chair, we not only talked about among, among G7 members, we talked with India, we talked with G20 Troikas, and uh, gathered all these forces together for that the G20 uh, becomes a unified you know, forum. So that role is important, and I think the same thing will continue to happen until the daily summit in uh, this fall. Ukraine had at one time been the third largest possessor of nuclear weapons. It was persuaded to relinquish those weapons by Russia, the UK, and the US. Ukraine did not want to give up their nuclear weapons. The Budapest Memorandum, signed on December 5th, 1994, resulted in a multilateral agreement affirming Ukraine's security and sovereignty in exchange for giving up its nuclear weapons. States are using weapons of mass destruction as threats and displays of supremacy in a dangerous power play, creating a distorted sense of what true power is that purportedly makes the world safe and secure for everyone, but which is now determined by the members of this nuclear weapons club that pose the biggest danger to global security in its power plays. Nuclear deterrence is still considered relevant in dealing with contemporary security issues and an important part of the official strategy of the U.S. to fight traditional threats. The existence of nuclear weapons and the threat of using it in a retaliatory attack is as immoral as an initial attack and we must stop utilizing it as a false equivalent to true security. Nuclear weapons, if used by design or accident, can pose unimaginable, devastating consequences on people and our environment. The city of Hiroshima, where the G7 leaders will meet this year, serves as a stark reminder of the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, which courageous survivors continue to remind us through their stories. We therefore applaud the inclusion of nuclear disarmament in the themes to be addressed at the G7 summit in Hiroshima and urge that the topic be included in future summits. Beyond their potential use, nuclear weapons continue to threaten us through their mere existence. For instance, resources spent on those weapons hinder the advancement toward achieving the SDG, SDGs and building the post-pandemic world. Therefore, they tangibly affect other priority areas to be addressed at the G7 summit. So I would argue that this year's G7 summit presents us with an opportunity to seriously rethink our understanding of security and international peace. We must wake up to the reality that nuclear weapons cannot be the means for achieving national security. Instead, we as the international community must work together to advance nuclear disarmament and promote human security, which was mentioned earlier in the conference. That's the only way to ensure our collective security and survival. The 2022 SGI Peace Proposal authored by our international president, Daisaku Ikeda, urges that we must detoxify ourselves from current nuclear dependent security doctrines. Based on this, I would like to share four potential recommendations on controlling nuclear weapons. The first is to adopt the no first use policy. The second area I would like to focus on is G7 leaders' role in advancing multilateral disarmament discussions. And next, I urge G7 leaders to take the opportunity of the summit in Hiroshima to reaffirm their commitment to create a world without nuclear weapons and take concrete actions toward the end. Last, as an organization committed to promoting peace and disarmament education, we call on G7 leaders to demonstrate their support for educational initiatives at every level. But the current tensions and uncertainties in the global security climate elevate not undermine the value and role of dialogue and diplomacy. 
it means that the forums like the G7 and the United Nations serve more important functions than ever. As part of the civil society, SGI stands ready to support multilateral efforts to resolve conflicts through peaceful means and achieve a better world together. Imagine if the Biological Weapons Convention said, if no country can use smallpox or polio as a weapon, but we will permit nine countries to use the plague as a weapon to maintain international peace and security. We would say that's absurd. It's morally incomprehensible and it's impractical, which it would be. But it's precisely the system that we have with nuclear weapons. So pressure has to be put on the states with nuclear weapons to live up to the promises that they've made pursuant to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the third most important legal instrument of the 20th century. The first being the UN Charter, the second being the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the third being this instrument, which has very effectively kept the number of nuclear weapon states in order. But in order for the treaty to gain its indefinite extension in 1995, promises were made to fulfill the commitment for disarmament, test ban treaty, fissile material cutoff treaty, strengthening international atomic energy safeguards, nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East. In 2000, 13 practical steps to walk down the ladder were iterated. In 2010, more of them. But they haven't been fulfilled. Good faith has not been demonstrated. The treaty cannot last if promises are not kept. And the very, the very lifeblood of peace on the planet, which is diplomacy and the rule of law, is corroded when promises are made and not kept. If diplomacy fails, then bullets become the only verbs that countries can use to communicate. So much is at stake at this moment. And much opportunity is presented at the summit in Hiroshima. I strongly endorse the uh, previous speaker's suggestion that one of the first items of business is a no first use, not just a no first use pledge, but a legally binding prohibition against the first use of nuclear weapons, whether it's by agreement amongst the parties with them, a Security Council resolution. It would be good if we had a General Assembly resolution. It would be good if pledges were made, but it would not be good enough because the stakes are so high, particularly high because of the failure to live up to the commitments in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. A no first ple use, use pledge would be good. Would that be good enough to save the treaty? I don't know. But if there's steps to move toward a legally binding prohibition, that would mean that deployments would have to change. That would change a great deal. We have to move in that direction. But the kind of thinking that we're hearing from SGI, the kind of thinking we're hearing today, resonates with the kind of thinking that the wise have told us, wise men like Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell, who in their famous manifesto said, remember your humanity, forget the rest. Put our humanity first. When activists like myself advocate for nuclear disarmament progress in the United States, we are told that our allies don't want this. We are told that the Japanese people, that the, that the country of Japan will become a nuclear weapon state if there's progress on nuclear disarmament. It is imperative that the government of Japan speak out and say the truth of the matter, the people of Japan want progress on nuclear disarmament, want progress on nuclear non-proliferation, and they should not be used to block progress in the world. That is an important message that can take place in Hiroshima and change the world. I pray and I hope that the truth be told. Nuclear weapons can and must be eliminated, and we all have to work together to do this. What makes the rules-based order work is that the most powerful countries in the world agree to voluntarily constrain some of their power 
in order to turn zero-sum dynamics into positive-sum dynamics. And what I'm observing today instead is that this global governance regime is under intense pressure from the changing balance of global power, particularly from the rise of China and U.S. reactions to that rise. China on one side and the U.S. and its allies on the other side are trapped instead in a classic security dilemma in which actions one side feels are defensive in nature are seen as aggressive by the other side. This heightened tension is exacerbated by a lack of communications between the US and China and by an increasingly wide definition of strategic competition that not only includes security competition over discrete issues such as um, the status of Taiwan or the South China Sea, but is now also has economic dimensions, technological dimensions, as well as a competition over values, human rights, and norms. So why am I up here on a panel about nuclear weapons talking about U.S.-China strategic distrust? It is because I believe these definitions that we're creating are drawing us down a very dangerous path in which both sides can excuse any conduct, partnership, or strategy that is in service of less lessening the threat of the, the other poses, regardless of the consequences. We cannot let China be the motivating factor of abandoning the rules of the road. We can't compete with China by becoming more like China. And the US has to be willing to accept some constraints on its power to lead, as President Biden has said, by the power of our example, rather than by the example of our power. Nuclear weapons ban treaty is adopted and signed and ratified by a great number of countries. But those countries who have nuclear weapons have not signed or ratified. And also those countries, Japan, Germany, Italy, other countries, and NATO have not signed that fight. In addition, those countries are telling other countries not to sign, not to ratify. This is a bad treaty. They are being hostile to the treaty. I think that is totally wrong. Particularly in a country like Japan, who has been against the nuclear weapons for so many years, should not be behaving against the street. In the last meeting of the parties to the treaty in uh, uh, Vienna, some countries, even the US allies, joined the meeting as observers. Japan could have participated as an observer and joined exchange of views and finding a way how Japan can help those countries. Even countries may not be able to join the treaty right away. There are many things they can do. For example, treaty has a provisions to help the victims of nuclear weapons or nuclear tests. There are people in Kazakhstan, Australia, uh, some Pacific Island countries, and Algeria, they are suffering from the consequences of nuclear tests. Japan can help those people because Japan has experience of treating people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They have a good medical expertise. Also, the treaty has a provision about the environmental remediation, which means after the land was contaminated in Australia, Algeria, or Kazakhstan of nuclear testing, there's a radiation remaining. You need to pay to go back to that game. Japan also have, has expertise in this because, unfortunately, Japan had a Fukushima nuclear accident. They had gone extensive decontamination works. They have actually expertise. So why don't join those, those countries and help them to work on the re remediation? Six recommendations for the G7 Hiroshima summit. They should criticize Russia's aggression to Ukraine as well as its threat to use nuclear weapons. They should announce a strong message 
against a criticism for military cooperation. They should encourage the United States and Russia to come back to negotiations on their on the reduction of such a critical weapons. So I submit here six recommendations. Should be one of the best opportunity to promote nuclear disarmament to a world without nuclear weapons. Questions? Yes. I'd like to ask the role of civil society, especially in the context of controlling nuclear weapons. Civil society can be enormously, uh, and, and in democracies, I think we have a moral obligation to exercise our agency on these existential issues and step up. And universities certainly have a role to that. And a university founded on the Lotus Sutra. Uh, a teaching of human unity, compassion, and values, it's, you know, it, makes them, it makes enormous sense to do so. Daisaku Ikeda has been a very famous um, intellectual as well as proponent of the abolition of nuclear weapons. And the reach of his uh, influence we can see here at this university and all around the world. Uh, so that is the uh, you know Buddhist component. We also have Pope, uh, the Pope indicate he took a strong stand when he visited uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki against nuclear weapons. So we must never underestimate 84 percent of the world's population are believers and adherent to some faith tradition. Many Americans uh, actually think that no first use is the current policy. They don't realize that first use is the policy. So I think in that regard, education, I we have to emphasize again, is such an important tool. And we really have to, as civil society, as academics, university, uh, have to be part of the voice to educate the public who may not know. What can be real actions that can be, what can be real agreements? from this G7, and like how I, as a Russian who is not living in the country currently, how can I um, affect something? Moral education uh, is foundational to even peace education. So now, how do we apply that to the countries? Just as George Schultz indicated, as I said in my presentation, Trust is a currency of diplomacy, and that this also requires. Not so long ago, when you were very young, the President of the United States led the people of the world and my country to believe that when we invaded Iraq, that the people of Baghdad would greet us with celebration and flowers. And my wife said, no, I don't think so. And when President Putin said that the people of Kiev would greet Russian troops, with flowers and celebration. I said to my wife, no, nah, I don't think so. Governments, your government, my government, are imperfect. The difference is this. In some governments, like this one here in Japan, people can speak freely and thus make corrections. Governments are always going to make mistakes. People are, people are just as our humans are. That's why free society is so important so we can be, speak freely and correct the mistakes that we make. Right now in Russia, you can't do that. It's dangerous. Part of that cosmopolitan, brilliant youth that I saw in Russia, that are part of the future that will build a world that crosses borders for peace. This season, you have to be careful. Play the long game. Because those values that you have, that, led you, that have led you to go around the world and learn, those values, of the human family are the hope for the future. Governments will not lead in this. Governments did not lead in human rights. Governments did not lead in gender equity. Governments did not lead in environmental responsibility. It is people that do this, and it's people like you with courage and curiosity that will be the future. So thank you for, for, for being that way. Uh, I'm introducing the first uh, Dr. Ela Kaputis uh, from G7 Research Group and she is the Director of Accountability of the G7 and G20 Research Groups. 
We know through the most recent Intergovernmental um, Panel on Climate Change Synthesis Report, the IPCC Synthesis Report, that an impending climate catastrophe is quickly closing in. So what can the G7 do now? And I'll offer eight very short recommendations and in no particular order. First, the G7 must ramp down fossil fuel subsidies and redirect those financial resources to green development initiatives. Almost $300 billion of public money was committed to the fossil fuel industry in 2020 alone. Secondly, the leaders must deliver and in fact go beyond their commitment to provide $100 billion a year on climate finance to marginalized communities and the global south. Third, the G7 needs to strongly encourage private sector investment in climate finance through innovative funding mechanisms, including things like green bonds and green investment funds. Four, the leaders must do more to promote sustainable infrastructure investment in renewable energy projects, in public transportation, and in greening buildings. Fifth, the G7 also more aggressively needs to support technology transfers, enabling the developing countries to adopt sustainable technologies at a much faster rate. Number six, the leaders must also adopt uh, disaster risk reduction strategies by prioritizing climate adaptation and climate resilience, particularly at the community level. And seven, nature-based solutions are critical through the protection of restoration of natural ecosystems around the world. And finally, transparency and accountability are also critical through the tracking and reporting on both the amount and the impact of climate finance that's been provided. I actually had planned to be in uh, this meeting in presence in, in Japan. Unfortunately, that wasn't possible because of something that I think is going to impact this G7 meeting. There was a nationwide strike here in Germany and all the trains were shut down and all of the airports, the major airports, were shut down. And therefore, my flight to Japan was cancelled. And the reason for this strike is because of the very high levels of inflation that are linked to the very high energy prices that are linked to the war in Ukraine. And if we really don't act, then we are seeing by the end of this century the potential for the child that is born today to be seeing temperatures that could be as high as 4 degrees centigrade higher. And if we look at Germany, because of the war in Ukraine, fossil fuel subsidies have actually increased. This is in part um, as direct support to industry that's been heavily impacted by the war, as well as um, uh, subsidies to consumers who are seeing their um, energy bills increasing by 65% in 2022 compared to 2021. So here, um, a 7.2 billion US dollar equivalent of fossil fuel support. These subsidies will have to be ended, but we need to do this in a way that does not threaten democracy. The G7 are the democratic country leaders of the world, and we have heard and we know that democracy is far less stable than we thought it was just a few years ago. I mean, I know the Ukraine crisis is definitely the, the urgent issue at the moment, but uh, just because of that doesn't mean that the climate crisis has paused just because of the Ukraine war. And the climate crisis already all, is already causing major economic and health damage. And this damage will continue to uh, escalate, and I think there's not been enough attention to this uh, damage. And not only the climate crisis, but uh, there are also various other crises um, which have been referred to as like crossing planetary boundaries and so um, and other environmental crises like uh, biodiversity and pollution and meaning that the Earth's ability to support humans is at uh, risk. 
And so therefore, I mean, I think that the recommendation, big, big picture recommendation is that Jesus needs to maybe prioritize climate security, which is actually a prerequisite for these other priorities, and the G7 should recognize the concept of planetary boundaries, which actually has not been recognized by governments uh, yet. And in the transport sector, again, a lot of people are emphasizing electric vehicles, but what we really need to do, I think, is, is have more public transportation uh, to reduce the energy uh, demand um, and not just uh, emphasis on personal uh, transportation vehicles. And another issue coming up is critical minerals because um, and the, these critical minerals are necessary for various technologies like renewable uh, energy and even especially electric vehicles. They need to be mined. This also causes environmental damage. We need to manage the critical minerals um, together um, and to do this to, together with renewable energy and to do this we need more um, circular economy to have more like recycling and you know, reuse the, the critical minerals and not just... You know, I mainly talk about how the health security issue are dealt with in the context of the G7, especially uh, related to Japan. But uh, that's the key issue maybe which may be necessary to be discussed at later might be the interaction about those several crises. You know, energy issue and health security issue and climate issue are interacting with each other and how to deal with uh, this kind of complex this might be the big issue. You know, G7 has a role to play in this area as uh, a major technology player and financial uh, player, but uh, you know, the key issue is the relation in cooperation with the, the global south. So the vulnerable people are the most affected by those kinds of the, the crisis. But also, you know, thinking about the, the manufacturing and distribution of the medical countermeasures and so on. So the cooperation with the global south is very important. So in that respect, this year, Japan is leading the G7, but India is leading the, the G20. And the cooperation between them is truly important, and India is actually playing an important role. Now the time for question and answers. So the floor is open. In Germany, they are... Uh, terminating the use of uh, nuclear power reactors. But uh, Germany still uses a lot of coal uh, to produce electricity. And it seems the uh, global warming is uh, proceeding faster than thought. So uh, even though uh, renewables may be introduced, that cannot be uh, keep pace with the uh, pace of global warming. So, uh, I wonder if Germany can change the course to reintroduce nuclear power generation. What is the discussion in Germany? Although there are a few voices saying maybe we need to continue with nuclear, in Germany that's a small minority. And there are several reasons for that. One is that the war in Ukraine um, points out that nuclear facilities can become powerful um, weapons um, of destruction if they are attacked, and therefore there's a lot of concern here. Second is the still huge problem of what do we do with a high-level radioactive waste that is left for our future generations to worry about. So, so we have to close this session. So thank you so much for all of you. And I think uh, we have the last session now, but before that, thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we would now like to uh, conclude today's conference with recommendations for the G7 Hiroshima Summit, and I would like to reintroduce Professor Jonathan Luckers from Silver University. It's a kind of go to the, the, the panel chairs are going to be discussing quickly what are the, the key recommendations uh, from their panels for the G7 Secretariat. Uh, the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs have kindly agreed that uh, our recommendations can be shared with uh, Foreign Minister Hayashi. So we are we're really hoping that this session has been both an interesting conference uh, but also that we will actually try to have some real inputs on the G7 summit in Hiroshima. 
uh, and, and thereby some kind of influence on the world. The first panel on G7 contribution to economic governance came up with the following three policy recommendations for the Hiroshima summit in May. First, in order to improve this performance and to meet today's unprecedented needs, G7 leaders at Hiroshima should commit to meet more often and mount uh, more ministerial meetings. So meeting more is the important uh, policy recommendation for G7. And second, G7 should improve its compliance by emphasizing the value of democracy and human rights in the management of global issues by holding ministerial level meetings on a particular subject and by establishing special working groups or task forces for that subject. And finally, although the challenges are mounting, Japan G7 presidency and Hiroshima summit in May 2023 should be made an important opportunity to consolidate uh, G7 synergies between uh, its members' priorities and key aspects for the G20 and UN agenda. So our session was titled Japan's Contribution to G7 Governance, and we learned the historical perspective on Japan's contributions to the G7 in diverse areas, as well as the leadership Japan is expected to take at the summit this year and beyond. There are lots of important points addressed, but um, I'd like to cover um, three key points from our session. The first point is that as the only Asian country to be represented with, within the G7, Japan has been playing an important role in ensuring that the Asian region's voices are heard and included on the G7 agenda, which might be otherwise overlooked. So Japan is expected to continue to be instrumental in this uh, role and including other stakeholders in the region in the process and on the G7 agenda. The second point is that Japan has been also playing an important role as a bridge between the US and other G7 members. Japan is so expected to cooperate with other G7 members in addressing broader issues that benefit not only a particular country but also the global community. The last point is that among the many global challenges that we are facing, in particular Japan has been consistent in their efforts for denuclearization and disarmament. Uh, to me next is Professor Curtin talking uh, about the keynote address. Number one, he agreed that uh, G7 leaders should meet more often. Uh, indeed, he said he could pull together a G7 summit within five days, which means they could be meeting uh, once a week, uh, just like uh, the European Union summits sometimes um, do. It does raise the possibility uh, that they could uh, have more meetings this year than just the one they had, which was uh, basically dominated by Ukraine to all the other subjects uh, we've spoken about, and to be a genuine uh, crisis uh, response uh, club. Secondly, he agreed uh, what more ministerial so was a good idea. In fact, he said that Japan had already upped it from the 14 they started with up to 15, uh, adding one for urban affairs. Uh, the question arising from that one is, why not one for our ministers of what we Canadians call national defense, right? Uh, we know Hiroshima is going to be dominated by the war in Ukraine. Uh, nuclear weapons is going to be big. I think ministers of uh, defense have something to say about that. But if that's too rich to the blood, uh, you could always start with aid to the civilian power disaster or relief. Uh, thirdly, uh, he said it was a three-day summit uh, up from the last one that uh, Japanese that uh, Japan hosted. This would actually provide the time for all G7 leaders on the margins of the Hiroshima summit to take a trip together to uh, Nagasaki. Fourthly, uh, very quickly, uh, Mr. Radioshi didn't mention it, it was in the slide, he did speak about uh, who was invited as country leaders and why, but what about the multilateral organizations that were invited? 
after what, 48, 49 years, uh, the G7 is not inviting the head of even one of the world's multilateral environmental organizations, even though climate change is a big deal. Finally, um, the nuclear um, health link, which we were uh, just discussing, we said, is there a 311 Fukushima agenda about how things nuclear are right can harm your health? And uh, for those who uh, called for uh, more uh, nuclear education, uh, if we could uh, reframe nuclear weapons and those associated with them as a uh, as a health issue. I had a six-member panel, you know, talk about uh, controlling nuclear weapons, and I saw at least nine interrelated points. You can probably group together in three different groups. Uh, that can be seen as proposals. Uh, for the G7 participants. And um, the first thing is that Japan has a unique moral authority when talking about the use of nuclear weapons. Japan also has expertise in helping countries and territories across the planet that had nuclear tests carried out on their territories, Algeria, Kazakhstan, Marshall Islands, Tahiti, etc. Secondly, uh, the G7 should really, and, and several people mentioned this, uh, understand the centrality of the Reagan Gorbachev axiom of a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. G7 sh should increase efforts to reduce rhetoric around the use of potential Russian nuclear weapons in the war in Ukraine. The G7 should help the world reject the idea of the policy of deterrence as something as immoral and unethical. The G7 should help us uh, see that the existence of nuclear weapons is a threat it, and oh, it was, she said the existence of nuclear weapons and the threat of using it in retaliatory attack is immoral as an initial attack. Finally, there are four points that came back again and again and again uh, about multilateral efforts. First, the G7 should work toward the elimination of nuclear weapons. Secondly, the G7 should work to facilitate discussions on multilateral disarmament and non-proliferation because they can't get to the point of elimination. As well as the ending of production of highly enriched uranium needed for uh, nuclear weapons. Fourthly, the G7 should start negotiations or a dialogue for nuclear risk reduction and ways to prevent the unintentional use of nuclear weapons. And finally, if not all else, the G7 should push for at least the adoption of a no first use policy. Uh, in my panel, uh, that is strengthening climate, energy, and health security, uh, all the panelists, uh, they uh, very nicely and elaborately give uh, lots of uh, recommendations. Uh, one of the key area of that recommendations that I found uh, is to ask for deepening and strengthening or broadening uh, the support for uh, other parts of the world. Another uh, categories of the recommendations uh, that is for the continuation of uh, support and also continuation of the commitment uh, focusing on uh, uh, like international laws and norms and also the commitment of phase out uh, fossil fuels. Uh, overall, uh, the other ongoing process like biodiversity protections, uh, to climate change, the reforestation, and forestation, greening of cities, and sustainable forest plans, but all of this should be prioritized uh, so that uh, the G7 uh, meeting in Hiroshima uh, could be really with uh, specific success. And obviously, Japan has a leading position, and also their experience uh, of that kind of environmentally vulnerable situations, so it, uh, we hope that. Uh, that uh, can help and to uh, get successful summit. And uh, this concludes the uh, International Conference on Advanced Security and Sustainability at the G7 Hiroshima Summit. Thank you.